Jim Murren, welcome to KTNV. Thanks for coming on. Let's talk about this uh, fairly astounding uh, op-ed that you had in USA Today, which you essentially said, I'm a lifelong Republican. I don't cross over very often to vote for the other side, but I'm putting a, your phrase, country over party, to announce that I am going to support Hillary Clinton. Why did you decide to do this and why uh, in, in a national newspaper? Well, I've been watching this race, as I think all uh, the world is, and I've been extraordinarily disturbed by uh, the extreme positions that one candidate has taken, the candidate from my party, the Republican Party, um, at a time when uh, I believe that I need to lend a voice as a CEO as to issues that I care about. I care about uh, trade. I care about diversity and inclusion. I care about immigration. I care about uh, the lives of others that are not getting the voice that they need. And, and I really feel um, that uh, Donald Trump is ill-suited to be president of the United States. Um, and the hateful rhetoric is, uh, is damaging to our country and its reputation around the world. And I also think that uh, Secretary Clinton is very well prepared for this job. And I don't have to agree with her on every position. Uh, to agree with the fact that we need to find middle ground on issues. We need to have a mature adult conversation. And I think that Secretary Clinton can do that, and I think uh, I don't think Donald Trump can. I wouldn't go so far as to say you're a reclusive guy at all. You do interviews, you're out there in the public, but there must have been something that told you at some point, was there a final straw, I need to go public with this, I want to write an op-ed. Did Hillary Clinton's campaign come to you and urge you to do this? How, yeah. Tell people how this came about. You know, I remember uh, when I was a young man, I, I could the first time I could vote was for George Bush in the primary, and uh, I did, and he lost to Ronald Reagan. And so I voted for Reagan Bush. And I loved the fact that I was excited. My father was active in, in small town politics as a Republican. I, I just was very proud uh, to be a part of the process. Fast forward to today, uh, coincidentally, both my sons will be able to vote for the presidential election for the, their first time. They're 21 and 18. And uh, I just couldn't sit by and say to my sons, uh, to my employees um, that I have no voice here. Um, so this is not something I, it's, I'm comfortable doing. I don't enjoy the political process, frankly, but I do have a view on, on these pivotal issues of immigration, on diversity. I think you know this, John, but 66 percent of my employees come from a diverse background, and a lot of them are really scared right now. They're just absolutely very scared. Um, and so I, I felt it was, would be wrong of me not to, uh, you know, have a voice. But I've made this clear. This is my opinion. It's not, I don't represent the company. I'm a private citizen. I'm not telling anyone how they should vote. I'm just asking them to look at the issues. It was a pretty strong piece, though. And you mentioned some of the issues. You just talked about trade and immigration and, and why you think Hillary Clinton is prepared. Uh, but, but I guess what I'm wondering uh, is, uh, you decided to go public and, and write this op-ed. Uh, was there a final straw? Had you been thinking about doing it? Did Donald Trump do something? Did Hillary Clinton do something that made you decide to do it? Um, there were a series of outrages that, of, out of Donald Trump's mouth. Um, I'm a, a big fan of Senator McCain. In fact, I'm proud to call him a friend. And his attack on a war hero was uh, one of I give you ten of them, but I'll, I'll, I'll give that you. Was my a, that one was a long time ago. Though. Yeah, and I, that started simmering. <clears throat> um, then the attack on Muslim Americans, and particularly uh, the Gold Star family. Uh, my doctor here is a Muslim American. Um, I have uh, tremendous respect for immigrants from around the world, and to uh, to vilify and frighten large swaths of Americans uh, is unconscionable. So I think it started with Senator McCain and more recently has been uh, the vitriol against uh, many minority groups and almost everything in between. Um, you know, criticizing or teasing uh, those who have handicaps, uh, the disparaging comments on women, um, 
the flippant answers uh, to really critical questions. Those are a series of issues. And, and as I thought about it, um, I said, okay, well, yeah, I'm a Republican, but I used to be on Wall Street too, John. And I know that Wall Street hates unpredictability uh, and it rewards stability. So we have, this is a, a business decision to me. We have one candidate, you know what you're gonna get. You either like her or not like her, but you know what you're gonna get. There's a lot of, uh, there's a body of work to look at and Wall Street will understand it. The equity and debt markets will understand that. And another candidate, you have no idea what's gonna happen. For trade, currencies, equity markets, debt markets, it's a complete unknown. Do you like her? I, I like a lot about her. I don't think uh, we're friends. Um, I love the fact that she's always prepared. And I've met her as a U.S. Senator. I've met her when she was Secretary of State. Now, I'll give you an example of what I think is, is valuable uh, for a president. I represented uh, the U.S. Travel Association. A number of CEOs went in to the Secretary of State at the time and said, we need to open up our borders for tourism. Um, yes, we have to protect ourselves from a homeland security perspective, but we cannot ignore the fact that we are a beautiful country people want to visit, and we need to promote the fact that we are the United States of America. Uh, and I was in that meeting with several other CEOs. She came in, she knew every aspect of the issue. She was always prepared. And I, I gotta tell you, I've been in front of a lot of senators and congressmen, and often the, the discussion starts with, hey, Jim, what do you want to talk about? Um, no grasp of, you know, issues at hand, no intellectual curiosity. So I think she's um, very intelligent. I think she's very prepared. I think she's a consensus builder. Um, I don't need to be buddies with the President of the United States. I need to respect the President of the United States. I need someone who is smarter than I am, and she clearly is. And I need somebody that can build teams, um, and that's why I'm supporting her. You know, it's interesting. Uh, to some extent, though, you're playing into a narrative that Bernie Sanders raised about her and that now Donald Trump is raising about her. You mentioned you used to be on Wall Street, as did your wife, and, and you came from there. Now you're, you're, you're a prominent executive, biggest company in, in, in Nevada, biggest employer, et cetera. So here you are, uh, and then she's had trouble trying to distance herself from Wall Street, given the speeches to Goldman Sachs. Mm -hmm. You're playing right into the narrative that she is the consummate establishment, no change candidate. You realize that, don't you? I, I do. <clears throat> I do. I, I realize that uh, she's been around a long time. Um, she's given speeches to a variety of institutions, including investment banks. Um, they paid her because they want to know what she thinks. Uh, they didn't pay her um, because she's unknowledgeable on topics. Um, I am a capitalist. And so, <laughs> look, if somebody, after I get out of my job, if somebody's willing to pay me a bunch of money to speak on a topic that I, I, I feel educated and informed about, I'm, I'm gonna take the money. Um, so, I understand that she's establishment. Uh, I don't know that that's wrong, really. Um, this is the best country in the world. And the country is doing well. Um, and the political process is not perfect. In fact, it's less perfect now than it has been probably in my adult Tell lifetime. Tell me about it. <laughs> and, but, you know, we have to find ways to, uh, you know, fix it from within. I don't think this blowing up the political process is going to help. Do, do, do you cringe when you read the, the stories about her and, and, and using the private server and what the FBI director said about her? Or do you think this is overblown? I mean, do you read this and shake it and say, oh, no, why did you have to do that? Or I can't believe she did that. Give me your honest, your candid reaction when you read about that with her. When I read about emails, um, I say, you know, this is, this is a world that is a work in progress. Um, there have been secretaries of state before her that have used uh, emails, private servers. Um, I think that uh, there was no malintent in doing it. I, I believe that. What was the intent, do you think, then? I think it was sloppy. I think it was, um, it was ill-informed. I think it was um, wrong. But not disqualifying. Not disqualifying. 
Um, and I think it's been investigated thoroughly, and I think that has been the, the, the professional conclusions. I will say that cybersecurity, just broadly, and you mentioned my wife Heather, she sits on a federal commission on this very topic. This is a very, very, very dangerous and important topic. Did she tell you that what Hillary did is crazy? Uh, no. <laughs> she, she didn't said, say that? She did not say crazy. <laughs> she said it's a work in progress. Mm -hmm. She said that the government, both state and local and federal governments, are not as prepared as they should <laughs> be from a cyber protection perspective. I believe that. Companies are not as prepared as they should be. We spend millions at our company to defend ourselves against cyber attack. Uh, and we know we can spend and should spend more. So on that topic, I think it's, uh, it's been fully vetted and it doesn't um, disqualify her. It doesn't even factor into my thinking. Uh, I, I guess what I'm wondering is about Jim Murn. You talked about uh, voting uh, in, in the Reagan-Bush uh, uh, election, your, your first one. Have you voted for a Republican for president every time since? Uh, almost. 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 You voted for Obama, didn't you? Uh, once. You did. Um, first time. Uh, yes, and uh, I have to say that um, I didn't know Senator McCain as well as I do now. Um, and I, as I said earlier, I admire him greatly. Uh, I really rarely uh, cross the aisle, and, I, and of course, uh, in this area, you'd have an ask, but why not? Um, I'm a big John Kasich fan. I think he would have been a tremendous uh, a candidate. He didn't get the airtime. Uh, I supported Jeb Bush earlier in his uh, run. Uh, I'm a huge Brian Sandoval fan, more locally here. So, you know, I've tried to, you know, look at candidates more from an individual perspective than as a party affiliation. Um, and I've said before, and I believe this, is that I, I believe I'm a Nevadan more than a Republican or a Democrat. I'm, if I would associate with a party, it's been the Republican Party, but I've really been, I think, more of a Nevada in the last 20 years. You know, but you mentioned it, uh, and, and you, you are that way, and, and I've known you for a long time. You've consistently been that way. You were a big Harry Reid guy yes. uh, in 2010. You even did a commercial uh, for Harry Reid. So I think a lot of people are going to say, oh, that guy's not a real Republican. Anybody who supports Harry Reid, I'm going to check his party registration. You know yeah. some people might say that, right? Yeah, I, I think people, a lot of people believe that. and. I learned early when I got here how hardworking and how valuable Senator Reid has been to this small state of Nevada. And I, I, I can uh, disassociate the party with the value to the state that I care so much about. And there has been no one um, in our century that has developed and worked harder for and delivered more for Nevada than Senator Reid. And, and I just feel very strongly about that. I've seen what he's done for infrastructure, what he's done for education, what he's done for medicine, uh, how he's de developed uh, infrastructure in our community. And uh, we are, I could tell you, uh, going to miss him deeply. Uh, and I'm very concerned about Nevada's role uh, and uh, in voice in Congress next year. You mentioned Brian Sandoval. I know you're a big fan of his. Uh, uh, does it strike you as strange? You just laid out a case, a very compelling case, I think, in some ways, why Republicans should be supporting Hillary Clinton as opposed to Donald Trump. Does it bother you that a guy who seems to be a common sense guy like Brian Sandoval and some other Republicans on the ballot this time will not say, I disavow Donald Trump for all the reasons you laid out, we're not going to go through them again? Th does that surprise you? Does it bother you? Um, it doesn't bother me because um, since I've uh, written that op-ed, I've gotten a lot of criticism myself. Um, people have said I'm not going to stay at an MGM property because uh, you support Hillary Clinton, or um, how could you say that? Uh, and I try not to put myself in other people's shoes. These are very personal decisions. Uh, I'm not an elected official. I don't uh, intend to know what goes through you know, the governor's mind or other or Republican politicians. Um, this is a very personal decision and one that I've never done before. I've never come out and said this, so I can't say, now that I've done this, everyone needs to uh, publicly declare themselves. I don't think that would be fair. Um, I do know uh, Governor Sandoval as an extremely uh, thoughtful, uh, caring person that has taken a lot of heat for the tax increase that he shepherded through. That you supported? That I completely supported um, because it's going toward uh, areas that we are in desperate need to improve, which is education, which is medical care, which are children. Um, but he took a lot of heat for that, and I, I admire him for that. And uh, 
I, I don't think that every politician needs to declare themselves on every issue. Uh, I think well, it's not a minor issue, though. I mean, you mentioned yeah. Sandoval, who did take a big chance, and I thought he was very bold, even visionary in what he did. That's what surprises me about him sticking steadfastly uh, by his, well, I'm not, I don't like things that Trump said, but I'm not going to say uh, I, I'm going to unendorse him. That seems yeah. strange, not to you. Mm, no, I haven't thought about it, honestly, John. I yeah. haven't thought about you, it. You I have think. a real life as opposed to me. I, I, <laughs> I, I think about it. I just want to wrap up this discussion. I just want to ask you a simple question. We'll go on to a couple other topics. Does Donald Trump as president of the United States scare you? Uh, yes. Uh, he uh, would create uh, instability in our financial markets. Uh, we would have multiple uh, trade wars. Uh, he's managed to alienate two of our most important trading partners uh, by saying he'll rip up NAFTA. Um, I travel around the world a lot, John. I go to China. I go to Asia in general. Uh, I'm in the Middle East in a week. Um, it's, it's, he would not be a stabilizing force, uh, both in terms of global politics or in terms of the economy. His economic plan uh, is wrong, I think. Now, you know, would I get a tax break under a presidency of Donald Trump? Absolutely, I would. Um, but I couldn't live with the fact that uh, that would come with the amount of pain that so many people would experience. Um, and that scares me. Uh, I, I feel the same fear that a lot of my employees feel right now, that, that uh, that's, a, that's a, an environment of, of, of a toxic hatred, and I just can't. Um, I can't envision that. Let's talk about a couple other things uh, more locally uh, uh, of interest to people. Uh, there's a lot of debate going on now in this community, as you know, about whether or not there should be a stadium built right. for, 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 for perhaps for the Raiders to come here, perhaps for UNLV. Uh, I get the sense that MGM is not thrilled with the idea of a lot of public money uh, whether you call it tourist money or not, going towards building a, a, a private facility. When MGM and AEG partnered uh, with all private money to, to, to build a T-Mobile arena. You think it's a bad idea, don't you? No, I think some level of public <laughs> financing is a good idea. And I think, uh, I'm glad you asked the question because I think there's some misunderstanding on this topic um, uh, on two fronts, if I may. One is that MGM is supporting the convention center. That's an MGM kind of benefit. and. Sands is supporting the stadium, and there's some type of, well, you know, trade-off there. Um, there's no trade-off there. And first, in terms of the convention center, this is not benefiting MGM. It's benefiting the community. You're talking about, the, in case people don't know, convention center expansion, about $1.4 billion or so. That's right. This is something that's about 10 years overdue. And every month that we wait costs our community about $50 million based on the math that has been laid out by the authority and vetted by almost everybody. So we are highly supportive of expanding and improving the convention center, even though it obviously competes against us. We have the largest convention facilities here in Las Vegas, but we know it's good for the community. Um, so that is, that's a, a must-have. The stadium is a nice to have. So we have, there are two topics here, I think, a must have and a nice to have. Now, on the stadium, yes, we have built uh, every arena that we own uh, privately. Um, and we're bringing uh, hockey to Las Vegas because of us and AEG. That doesn't mean that the public shouldn't participate in, at some form for a stadium. And we've never been opposed to the stadium or a level of public financing for the stadium. Why should the public pay for it? There is a, a benefit of tourism um, that would accrue to having a stadium here. There's some economic benefit um, that would, would benefit all of us. And so I, I think there is a, a level of money. The challenge, John, to me, is uh, as a fact-based person, um, I don't have any of the information that I need to evaluate what the right level of public financing is because we have no idea what it will cost. Um, not only the exact number, which has ranged from a billion four to 2.2 .2 and everything in between, or where it will go, or what other infrastructure costs uh, would, would be needed. It would be as if I went to MGM and said, to my board, uh, I'd like to build an arena 
I'm not sure exactly what it's going to cost and where we're going to put it and how I'm going to finance it, but let's just green light that guy. Um, the, my board wouldn't have gone for that. And so uh, I, I do support some level of public financing, but I think there has to be a balance between this because what's going to happen, we know this, right? Whatever level of public financing is approved, uh, if it is, will be highly scrutinized and in many cases criticized. Um, and there's no community in the United States uh, that would give the level of money that is being talked about um, on this stadium. There's none. Uh, Oakland has already said to the Raiders, here's a hundred million dollars, maybe. Um, the Rams are going back to LA with zero public financing. Um, and so I think that we just have to study this more, more thoroughly. I do agree, as I said, with some level of public financing, but the quantum is, is, is one that we can't even evaluate because we don't have the information. Does $750 million sound like too much to you? I think that uh, $750 million sounds like too much to me. Um, but again, there has to be a balance. Uh, if, if, if it's $750 million on a $3 billion stadium, maybe it's not too much. If it's $750 million on a billion five, yes, it's too much. Um, but I just don't have enough information to say one number's good, one number's bad. I think the critical issue here is it's not up to this committee to, to have to, to answer these questions. It's up to the developers. I mean, they have to provide the amount of information required for the Tourism and Infrastructure Committee, which by the way, that's what the committee is. It's not the stadium committee. <laughs> it somehow got morphed into uh, this is that's the stadium. That's just a generic group. way of referring to it. <clears throat> Excuse yeah. me, I mean, that, that's basically what their business is. They, they, they made a proposal on the convention authority expansion. Now yeah. they're essentially focused on the stadium committee. And, and I'm not gonna go through all the history of that, but that committee was formed by an executive order, so the stadium issue didn't become an issue in the legislature. But that's I'm not right. telling you anything that, that you don't already know. Steve Hill, when I had him on, the chairman of what I will call the stadium committee, even though you don't <laughs> like that, was, was just on with me this week, and he is sticking by his uh, proposal that the public, after a certain return on investment for the developers, should share in the profits if the public is going to invest in it. Does that make sense to you? It does. Um, I'm a big fan of Steve Hill, by the way. I think he's done a tremendous job for the state. Uh, I think he's very thoughtful. I watched your show. Um, and uh, I agree. Uh, I think that, uh, and I liked what he said also. He said you can't get in love with a deal. I think it was something along those lines. He said and, that about every deal he's made as the head of the economic development. And I feel the same way at MGM. You can't get too engaged and in, in, invested in love with a transaction. So I think the governor um, has got the right people on that committee. They're elected officials, they're private sector folks, and, and Steve Hill chairing it I think is the right mix. Uh, I think they'll come to the right answer, and I don't know what that is, but I, I go back to there has to be a balance to this, um, and you have to have the requisite amount of information, and as of yet, there, that does not exist. The case hasn't been made is what you're saying. The so case far. has not been made, and look, I'm a huge NFL fan. Um, I know you're a Bills fan. I'm a Giants fan. Uh, We're not going to talk about that I'm game, are sorry. we? In the Super Bowl? Let's not go back to that yeah, game. A field goal. I, no, no, I'm not going to bring it no, up. Oh my goodness! The rest of this interview is really going to be unpleasant for <laughs> you after bringing up the Scott Norwood game. Uh, but uh, look, you know, I'd love to see it. And 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 if Mr. Adelson and Mr. Roski, you know, I admire the fact that they have uh, this vision. I admire that. And and MGM will uh, and I will support at some level, you know, this stadium. Um, it's just a matter of getting those facts. We so you're not know. opposed to it now? Is I'm absolutely, I've never been opposed okay. to it. All right. uh, a couple other things, uh, because I'm keeping you for a while. Uh, the other, there's a big issue on the ballot this time that would deregulate uh, the, the electricity market. Uh, you have had some issues with, with the power company, with, right. with Envy Energy, talking about leaving uh, uh, the, the purview. Do you support deregulating the electric market here? Uh, I do. You do? Um, we, we decided as a company to leave. We we're paying an extraordinarily high <laughs> exit fee of $87 million. An exit fee uh, is appropriate for us to pay. Um, I could quarrel with the number, but it is appropriate to ensure that no homeowner is adversely affected by a large power user leaving the system. Uh, and I, we understand that, we appreciate that view, and, and so we're paying that. We believe in, um, in the fact that 
as the largest consumer of energy, we have to you know, be a leader on sustainability. Uh, it's a core value of our company, something I care deeply about, uh, renewables, getting off of fossil fuels. Um, and uh, you know, regulated uh, power is not a good, good pathway. So um, it won't affect us. Um, we're leaving the system. But I do support alternative energy and deregulated power. There, there, it's not that simple an issue, though, right? I mean, no, it's and not. Because, because it hasn't worked in some other jurisdictions, deregulation. Most people, as I like to say, want to go into their house, turn on the light switch. They want the lights to come on. They want the AC to, to, to come on. I mean, th this has to be vetted, don't you think? It, 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 it definitely has to be vetted, John. Um, and it's not something that... Uh, we, we could take lightly. No Are you going to put a lot of money it. into it as a company? To, no. You're not? No. We're, 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 we've already declared ourselves we're leaving the system. Um, this is what we're doing. So you're and not going to help finance the campaign? to? We, we have not been a major contributor to it, no. All right, just a couple other things I want to talk to you about. Let's just talk about the, the, the health of MGM uh, Resorts. Uh, I, I, I checked before this interview the stock is pretty close to what it was about a year ago. I think it was 22, now it's 24, so, something along those lines. You've just uh, recently announced this major restructuring of the company. There was still a lot of talk for a lot of time. But I don't want to bring up flashbacks for you about how much debt uh, that, that you have. Give us your candid assessment of where MGM Resorts is today and where you think it can go. So we just had our best quarter, meaning the last three month period um, that we've had since 2007. So um, we are, f and we just had the best July, the month of July we've ever had as a company. So we were on our, we were on our last legs back in 2009 and 10. We were as hard hit as any company in the recession, and it was a gut wrenching time. And uh, those scars are never going to heal for me, John. I tell you, um, but that was a point where we had so much debt because we we're building city center and our cash flows were plummeting. And the way the markets look at that is how much debt you have versus the cash flow you generate. And we had 11 times the amount of annual cash flow in the form of debt, 11 times leverage. That number right now is 4.8 times. Um, and we are just about investment grade company today uh, by the major rating agencies. So is that because you're doing better or is that because of this very complicated restructuring? And I don't want to talk about REITs and some of the other things right. that you've done because I don't want to lose people, but is it because of the, 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 is it a technicality or is the company really improved? It's dramatically improved. We're making a lot more money um, as an organization. Uh, our revenues are going up. Visitation Las Vegas has improved. MGM's market share within Las Vegas has improved capital spending that we've made in terms of expanding the Mandalay Convention Center, the T-Mobile Arena, upgrading rooms is working, and uh, we've been able to pay off an awful lot of debt. So uh, at to a point where people are starting to think now this is going to be a company that will start returning cash back to the shareholders, which we likely will do in a couple of years in the form of dividends or other ways of returning capital. Uh, what about Macau? Uh, the, the, you know, Macau was way up here and now then it's yeah. plummeted. There was this recent transaction where MGM bought some MGM China and, and I saw a headline that said it even baffled Wall Street, like what are these yeah. guys doing? Are you bullish on Macau suddenly again? You know, I, I'm bullish on it long term and it uh, it's a small transaction. We bought 5% of MGM China. Right. Um, now we own 56%. And 51 so to 56? 51 to 56. Why do that? It's incremental. Um, there aren't many times we can buy stock because of uh, securities laws, and the only person we could buy stock from is Pansy Ho, uh, the largest individual shareholder, and so it takes two to do a transaction. I've been trying to get her to sell stock for a while. She was willing to sell some because she wanted to buy more of MGM Resorts stock. So I'm very uh, optimistic about Macau long term. Steve Wynn's opening a property literally almost any day now. Uh, it's going to be beautiful. Uh, I think it's going to drive people to um, that part of Macau. That's good for us because we're building right next to, or, to right. them. It opens up next year. So yes, I'm long term very positive on Macau. It's been very choppy over the last several years. It went down dramatically from its peak um, two years ago. I think we've hit the bottom. And long term, I want to own more of MGM China if I can. Final question, are you still as bullish on web gaming as you once were? You and I have had these conversations. I know the company really saw a frontier out there. Uh, is it going to happen? I think it's going to happen. Um, I think that what's happened since the last time you and I chatted about this, we've had 
e an eSports tournament at Mandalay Bay where we had 13,000 people watching people play video games. Um, we've done virtual reality uh, uh, shows that have done really, really well. We've launched a mobile gaming app. Um, this convergen convergence between the internet and bricks and mortar gaming is is inevitable. It's the, we're going we're to see more and more of this. We haven't uh, announced this yet, I don't think. Maybe I'll do it on your show, but w in December we're opening up a millennial gaming area at MGM. We're taking the old Rainforest Cafe space right near Hakkasan and spending a few million dollars and we're going to create an immersive environment that's geared toward millennials and to see whether they like that. Are you saying I couldn't get in there? You won't like it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're a beer pong fan. Um, well, you might be, I don't know. No, I'm but, not. <laughs> um, um, but it, it's, it's it really a test to see whether or not we can c continue to adapt to uh, the changing demographics and I think it's going to work. You just can't stop it, right? You just you can't, can't stop it. You can't wish it away. You can't stop it, and I don't think we should. If it's it's similar to sports, you know, where would the leagues be without sports betting? Um, why would we? What what is the hypocrisy, and why should we continue this? And the fact that we brought we convinced the NHL to uh, grant an expansion team to Las Vegas is very telling. I would predict that we're going to have a basketball team here in a few years. Um, yes, I'd love to see a football team if it could be financed. Um, this is all good for Las Vegas. This creates uh, more reasons to come and, and breaks down these, these barriers of prejudice that has existed that are uh, outdated and obsolete. Despite your raising the painful memory of the Giants-Bills Super Bowl, <laughs> it's been a pleasure having you. Thanks for coming on. It's my pleasure, John. Thank right. you.